So I'm not going to lie to you, I thought today's special music was particularly good. <laughs> that was amazingly done. And I, I uh, was quite impressed with the accompanist as well, I might add. <laughs> yes, thought she played beautifully. So, very nice, very nice. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate your work today. I almost got up early. We jumped just straight, straight to the offering, and then we're on. Let's go. Yeah. All right. I like it. No, thank you, man. Good work today. All right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day, this chance for us to be here. This day set aside for things like this, not just this, but things like this. We thank you for that, Lord, and we pray today that you will speak to us about this day on which we're gathered. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about doctrines this summer, and we're using an image for it, the idea of a frame. You see, the faith is not just about its teachings, it's do the teachings of the faith direct us to the point of the faith, and the point of the faith is Jesus. The doctrines form the frames, but within the frame, we need to always see the picture of Jesus. The doctrines will give us clarity, and they will give us a common starting point for our life of faith, but we have to be careful, because if we don't constantly monitor ourselves, and in some degree each other, We'll begin to argue so much about the doctrines themselves, they'll become the picture, and we'll completely lose sight of the point. They're there designed to help us focus, but they must never become the picture. Now, if you were to go to the web page for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you would see at the top there a heading that says beliefs. And if you click on that heading, a page would come up that that showed on the left-hand side six uh, basic doctrines in a summary form. But if you wanted a little more detail and you went to the right and you went about a third of the way down, you'd see a little bar you could click on that would give you the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you went there, you would find before you got to the 28 these words, and I think these words are very important. They say, Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs, as set forth here, constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teaching of Scripture. Revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of Bible truth or finds better language in which to express the teachings of God's holy word. And it's an important statement because the doctrines themselves are not our creed. The Bible is our creed, and it is to the Bible we turn. And unless you've got it memorized and know everything exactly that it teaches, then maybe be a little humble with what you believe, right? Right? We've expressed what we think it says, but we also expect God to continue to lead us into deeper and fuller understandings. And today we want to take a look at one of those fundamental beliefs expressed as we understand it, but not itself the creed. It's fundamental belief number 20. Now, don't worry too much about the numbers there. They're kind of laid out in a, in a way that makes sense, but... But it's not like the important ones are all first and the unimportant ones are all later. Don't, don't worry about that. They're all in there together. But this one happens to be fundamental belief number 20, and this is what you would read if you went there right now. The beneficent creator, after the six days of creation, rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of this seventh-day Sabbath as the day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ, 
a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. The Sabbath is God's perpetual sign of his eternal covenant between him and his people. Joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive acts. Now, not that this matters a whole lot, but just because it's true, I like this one. I like the way it's written. I like what it brings out. I like the way it's done. I particularly like the four-part description of the role that Sabbath plays in our lives. A symbol of our redemption in Christ, a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. But now I want you to realize something here. The Sabbath as a frame is considerably different than creation as a frame. We talked last week about how critical the frame of creation is to the picture of Jesus because without the frame of creation, the picture of Jesus gets pretty warped and pretty weird because if God didn't create the world, what in the world is Jesus doing coming to save it? If he and God are not creator of this place, then he is an invader of this place who has no business here. So you see, God as creator is key, or the picture of Jesus gets strange. But Sabbath is a little different. Sabbath doesn't so much keep that picture of Jesus in perfect order. What Sabbath does is bring out highlight and detail in the beauty of the face of Jesus. It's a different kind of frame, but it still plays a very important role. It explains the picture of Jesus as our Redeemer, as well as the picture of Jesus together with the three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as Creator. Now, I think Sabbath is genius. It was a genius creation of God, for it is able to teach us in so many different ways. First of all, it is something concrete in that it is something we can do, which enables understanding for those who really can't ever understand anything unless there's something they can do. Sabbath gives us that. Yet at the same time, it is abstract because it's made up of time, and time has no concrete substance. It is historical in that it was established long ago and we can look back at the impact and the role that Sabbath has played through the generations. Yet at the same time, it is current. It is happening right now, today. It is routine in that it comes each week, thereby bringing security to those who need consistency in their life and bringing a reset time for the more free-spirited among us. Yet... Every Sabbath is a new experience. It is intense in that it demands intentionality on our part if we would truly experience the intended blessing. Yet, it is relaxed in that it is a day of rest and stopping. And it is simple. Anybody can do it. And yet, it is so deep that I don't think any of us will ever fully come to understand the meaning and the insight that Sabbath longs to bring us. The truth is the Sabbath is way more than we could ever earn or ever deserve, but then that's all part of the good news. You see, we weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. And because of that, it's exactly what we need. Maybe you recognize those words. It's a paraphrase from Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now I can't think of anything that God made for us that we don't need. Can you? Air, food, Water, God made that for us. We need that, right? Earth, wind, and fire. I don't need, mean the band. I'm not sure we needed that. But, 
But the elements we needed. Mountains, rivers, lakes, valleys, plains, oceans, plants, animals, pets, sunrises, sunsets, rainbows, family, friends, relatives, faith, hope, love. I can't think of anything God made for us that we don't need. And Jesus says the Sabbath was made for us. Well, I guess that pretty much means we need it. But why? Well, I want to talk about why. Four main reasons. One has two parts. Why Sabbath? Well, it's a sign of receiving from God what we could not do for ourselves. Two parts. Sabbath is permission to stop. Sabbath is permission to spend time, and Sabbath is a foretaste of eternal life, but only if you do it right. So let's talk about these four. We'll begin with a question. How many of you sitting here today listening to me exist? Okay, good. I was hoping I'd see a hand or two. How many of you exist? How many of you are real? Good, yeah, that's like two-thirds. That's awesome. (laughs) We need to look into the rest of you guys. Don't know what's going on there. All right, second question. What part did you play in bringing about your existence? Not so much, right? I'm reminded of the words of God in Job chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimension? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? That's a good reminder, isn't it? Lord, save us from two sins. I said this last week. The first of denying that you're the creator and the second of claiming we know exactly how you did it. Our existence is a gift we have received that we did nothing to bring about. And all we know about what God has done is what he's told us. We would do well to remember these points. And we would do well to remember the day that God designed to serve as a reminder that we owe our existence to the God who gave us existence. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In the book Great Controversy, Ellen White quotes another early Adventist pioneer, J.N. Andrews, and adds some comments. By the way, within this frame series, we're going to have a week where we, we talk about Ellen White, but also just prophecy in general. And, and another week... Uh, where we talk about the theme of the great controversy. So these are things coming up. But, but, but for right now, I want to read you something here. Ellen White is quoting J.N. Andrews, and she adds a comment in the middle and then some at the end. Andrews writes, The importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of creation is that it keeps ever present the true reason why worship is due to God. And this is Ellen White's comment. Because he is the creator, and we are his creatures. Now back to Andrews. The Sabbath, therefore, lies at the very foundation of divine worship. For it teaches this great truth in the most impressive manner, and no other institution does this. 
the true ground of divine worship, not of that of the seventh day merely, but of all worship, is found in the distinction between the Creator and His creatures. This great fact can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. And then Ellen White picks up the theme. It was to keep this truth ever before the minds of men that God instituted the Sabbath in Eden. And so long as the fact that he is our creator continues to be a reason why we should worship him, so long the Sabbath will continue as its sign and memorial. Now this is an amazing, an amazing claim here. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. That's a bold claim, isn't it? We did nothing to create ourselves. We received our lives as a free gift. Scripture says in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and then ceased from his labor and rested on the seventh, thereby sanctifying it and making it holy. He gave us our existence for free and he gave us the Sabbath for free that we might have a free day so that we could understand and never forget that he is our creator. So that's the first way of, of Sabbath serving as a sign of receiving. It's two parts. It's, it's receiving existence. But now there's another part to the Sabbath as a sign of receiving. There's another free gift we've received that Sabbath symbolizes. And I want to begin with the question again. How many of you sitting here today listening to me are sinless and have earned your own salvation? I'm hoping to not see hands this time. Okay, very good. A follow-up. Are you saved by your works, or are you saved by your faith in the work of Jesus Christ? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All right, so in the same way that we receive our existence as a gift from God to which we contribute nothing, so also do we receive our salvation as a gift from God to which we contribute nothing. And just as Sabbath serves as a sign and a reminder of the creation work that we rest in, so also Sabbath serves as a sign and reminder of the salvation work that we rest in. You think I go too far with that? I mean, I know about the commandment linking Sabbath with God as creator, but where is the commandment linking Sabbath to God as deliverer? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The Ten Commandments are given twice in the Bible. The first time in Exodus 20, and that's the one we most often read. But the Ten Commandments are given again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And they are practically identical except for a couple changes and one very significant change to the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath Commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, we read these words. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. That's essentially the same. Little adjustment in the language. But here comes the radical change. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, 
and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. No mention at all of creation. It's all about deliverance. In Exodus, the Sabbath serves as the reminder and sign of God's work of creation, and we are called to rest in that work. But in Deuteronomy, the Sabbath serves as the reminder and sign of God's deliverance. With Israel's deliverance from Egypt as the precursor to the deliverance from sin that would come to all through Jesus Christ. And that's not all the parallels there are. You see, at the creation, God completes his work on Friday. He rests on the seventh day, and then he gets back to work on Sunday. In the same way, Jesus completes his work of salvation on Friday, rests on the seventh day in the tomb, and gets back to work on Sunday after that. You remember from last week, these are two of the conviction things we hold. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, our Savior. We hold that by faith. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We hold that by faith. And of these things we hold by faith, in both cases, God behaves exactly the same way. He finishes the work on Friday, he rests on the Sabbath, and he gets back to work on Sunday. And in both cases, Sabbath becomes the sign and the reminder to us that it is by grace we've been created, and it is by grace that we've been saved. The next way I want you to think about the Sabbath is permission to stop. As it turns out, we humans are not very smart sometimes. Maybe you've noticed this. Some of us won't work at all. Some of us won't stop working. Some need the part of the commandment that says, six days shalt thou labor. Some need the part that say stop on the seventh. Which are you? I bet you know. This part is for those of you who are non-stoppers. You see, God has set up reality to thwart and aggravate all the overachievers. Option one, work every day, kill yourself, die young, and achieve less. Option one. Option two, Stop every seventh day, even when you don't want to. Live longer, discover you have a family, and still achieve more than you would have if you hadn't stopped. It's not fair, I admit it, but it's true. I believe Sabbath is a big reason that Adventists have been scientifically shown to live nearly a decade longer than most other Americans even as poorly as we pay attention to Sabbath, it still blesses us. You know, I think in some ways, this was a bit more immediate in a more agrarian farming society. You see, we live in a day where, where there's such thing as a work week and a weekend. And even if you sometimes spill into that or sometimes are asked to go into that, there is this assumption that you got five working days and then a, and then a weekend. But you see, back when you were working for yourself and you lived in your your own little house on your own piece of land and whatever grew in the field was what you ate the next year, it was pretty immediate. And when it was plowing and planting season, it was the time to work. And I'll I'll bet it was pretty hard to believe that stopping on the seventh day in the midst of your plowing and planting was a good idea. And that, in fact, by stopping, you'd be able to get more done. But here's the thing. You could have kept going on continuously, but you know what happens when you do that? You break down, and your animals break down. You notice how the commandment says, don't work your animals either. God knows we need to stop. 
And I'll bet in harvest season it was pretty hard to leave grain in the field. Yet God said, stop and trust me. Will you trust God to bless you? You know, you're thinking about it week to week. If I, just, if I just keep going a little longer, if I just work Saturday, if I just keep moving, I can get that much farther ahead. Will you trust God to stop when he says stop? Or will you trust the strength of your own arm and your own ability to do more? What are you going to trust? It's kind of funny when I reflect on it. During my college years, I probably wouldn't have qualified for anywhere close to orthodox Sabbath keeping. I didn't go to church much. Not all of my decision making was, was that good at the time. But there was one thing when I was in college that I hung on to. And that was I never studied on Sabbath. Now, I might have used the time to do some other questionable things, but I never studied on Sabbath because you know why? I don't have to. God said we don't have to work every day. And somehow I got through despite myself. I faced Sabbath issues three times in my working days as an engineer before I became a pastor. I've told you some of these stories before. The first time I stood up for what I believed and was blessed. The second time I compromised and ended up getting fired from that job. The third time I finally gave up, quit, and became a pastor. Sabbath has always played a huge role in the course of my life. So permission to stop. The next way I want you to think about Sabbath is permission to spend time. Sabbath is so much more than just coming to church. It's about time. Time for what you would never have time to do otherwise. Now I'll give you a perfect example. Our experience from this last Sabbath. We were here at church, we did all the church things, but then when church was over, we went to lunch at the home of our good friends. And they set up on that day to have a special surprise celebration for my wife, whose age I will not name, but she has finally caught up with me in age. I'm very proud. They invited us over for a dinner and a celebration, and and so we all went over there. But let me tell you how it worked. There was no official start time to the event. There was no official stop time for the event. There was no rush to arrive in time. There was no rush to get to the next appointment. Just friends sitting and talking and laughing and singing and praying. Who else besides Sabbath keepers have time for that kind of spending together? I mean, what other day of the week do you routinely have nothing scheduled to do and no housework beyond the meal itself from around 12.45 until dark? What other day do you go home at 12.45 and you got nothing except one meal planned until the sun goes down? No, you can't spend your days like that. Who lives in a world where where you have a day where you go from 1245 to dark with nothing planned? Oh, yeah, we do. Isn't it awesome being us? Or better, isn't it awesome when we take God at his word and follow his commands? One of the saddest things I ever see happens to me on on Sundays sometimes at around 1 o'clock or so if I have to go to the grocery store. And I run to the grocery store, and I see a family at the grocery store pushing the cart, and they're not dressed for the grocery store. They're on their way home from church. Can you think of anything you'd less like to do after church than go to the grocery store with the family? Very few 
of the people I run into in that situation are going to go home and experience the experience you and I know every seven days. I'm not a legalist for keeping the Sabbath, but you may be a masochist for not. God gives you a day off from work and labor that you can spend with friends and family and you don't take it? And I'm the crazy one? No, the Sabbath was made for men and women because God knows how badly we need it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because you need it. And then finally, Sabbath is the foretaste of eternal life. Sabbath is a foretaste of eternal life. Life where there isn't always a rush to get done with living before we die. I mean, when it really comes down to it, that's what pushes us. We have got to get done before we die. And it drives us. Sabbath is a rest we must intentionally enter, though. And the weekly Sabbath teaches us how to enter that greater rest that God calls us to. I want to read you a rather lengthy section of the book of Hebrews because it deals with this reality of the foretaste of eternal life. Sabbath is the foretaste of the eternal rest to which God calls us. And I want you to hear this. We begin in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt, the original deliverance? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore... Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. This is what Sabbath teaches us how to enter the rest. Just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, on the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Have you entered 
the rest that God is calling you to. There is no better practice for entering that ultimate rest than the practice of resting on the Sabbath day. Now, don't misunderstand. Sabbath as we know it is not the greater rest that this passage is speaking of. Instead, Sabbath is the example of, the foretaste of, the eternal rest that comes to all who learn to trust in Jesus. Sabbath is your chance to practice eternal life. The Sabbath is a frame and a most valuable frame for within the frame of the Sabbath we come to understand very clearly just how beautiful the picture of Jesus really is. How sweet the rest is. Sabbath is a sign of receiving from God what we could not do for ourselves, our existence through creation and our salvation through Jesus Christ. Sabbath is our permission to stop. Sabbath is our permission to spend time. And Sabbath is our foretaste of eternal life. We are not made because God needed someone to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made because God knew we needed something to keep us. Sabbath was made for you, so don't miss it. Instead, embrace the Sabbath as a dear friend. And within the frame of the Sabbath, the picture of Jesus will become even more beautiful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath frame that so well reveals how our God has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And we consciously choose to rest in that Sabbath, knowing that this is training for the great rest that comes to all who believe in Jesus. Father, bless us in this Sabbath day, in all of its hours. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.